Welcome, everyone. What a beautiful spring day. It's just incredible. Um, and it doesn't even seem rain. Well, it'll be rainy, true mud season tomorrow and Sunday, right? But, um, but right now, just gorgeous. We are so thankful to have you all here. And we are also grateful for our partnership with the ACLU for this speaker series on civil liberties and the presidency. Um, it, I really, I firmly believe that the place of a, a law school is not just kind of a building and in, in a city, but it should be a living, breathing part of the community where people come in and have discussions and debate important issues on all sides. And there is no place better to have that kind of a law school and that kind of a community than here in New Hampshire especially during this primary season. So here at UNH Law, I just want to give you the warmest 70-something degree welcome and, um, and tell you how proud we are to be part of this community and how happy we are that you are here. We look forward to a great discussion tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Megan. Um, my name is John Graby, and I direct the Warren Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Service here at the law school. Uh, the Rudman Center provides curricular and experiential and financial support for law students interested in going into public service, and it also serves as a face of the university here in Concord by presenting public programming, like tonight's event, uh, that aligns with its mission. Um, as Megan just said, we are so pleased uh, to be partnering with the ACLU of New Hampshire uh, to be offering this series on civil liberties and the presidency. Tonight, we welcome Congresswoman Tol uh, Tulsi Gabbard to the Rudman Center. Tulsi Gabbard has represented Hawaii's second congressional district since 2013. She is the first Samoan American member of Congress. She served in a field medical unit of the Hawaii Army National Guard in a combat zone in Iraq from 2004 to 2005 and was deployed to Kuwait from 2008 to 2009. From 2002 to 2004, she served in the Hawaii House of Representatives. When elected to the Hawaii House, she was 21 years old, making her the youngest woman to be elected to a U.S. state legislature. Both the Rundman Center and the ACLU of New Hampshire are nonpartisan and neither endorses political parties or candidates. Moderating tonight's discussion will be Jean Jeannie Haruska of the ACLU. Now please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Aloha. I heard Megan talk about the 70 degree weather here. You guys are making me feel right at home. <laughs> Didn't have to pack any big coats on this trip. It is great uh, to be back here in New Hampshire and I am grateful to uh, the ACLU and UNH Law School for hosting this series uh, and for inviting me to be here to join all of you today. I'm glad to have the opportunity to introduce myself to you and to share a little bit about why I'm running for president. You know, I'm having, having the opportunity to travel to different parts of the country, uh, to gather with small groups and large groups of people. Uh, I am filled with hope, and I'm inspired. Because even as you scroll through Twitter, or you turn on the cable news, or you scroll through the headlines, you see a lot of darkness, a lot of divisiveness, a lot of bad news a lot of hatred. I think sometimes we feel like it's difficult to escape this. But it is in the hearts and voices of the American people where we find our hope, where we see the opportunity to pull ourselves out of this dark hole we find ourselves in and to build this path forward to bring about the kind of real, big, systemic change that we need to see in this country. It is disheartening, and I can tell you it's disheartening from Washington, where I've served now for over six years. But I know a lot of you feel the same way that I do, to see how too often 
whether it's self-serving politicians or greedy corporations or some in the media who constantly try to tear us apart, who for their own power or greed or ratings or whatever their, their uh, motives may be, are trying to incite this divisiveness to pit one group of us against the other, whether it be because of our politics or the color of our skin or where we come from, who we love, how we worship. All of these things that make us unique are too often in our, in our world today being used to tear us apart, which is unacceptable on so many levels, but especially because it undermines our values. It undermines who we are as Americans. And it undermines this vision that our founders had for us. This vision of standing together, standing united as Americans, and making sure that we have a government that is truly of the people, by the people, and for the people. These are words we have heard so often throughout our lives. Right? A government of, by, and for the people. But it is that for the people that has been so forgotten. How many of you feel that our, that our government, that our leadership in Washington is truly living out that vision for the people? It's not. Instead, what we have, essentially, and we see this carried out through the policies that are being passed in Washington, the things that are being talked about is really what we have as a government that is of the powerful, by the powerful, and for the powerful, while we, the people, get left behind. We have a government that is of the special interest, by the special interest, for the special interest, those greedy special interests and corporations who have the money to buy the lobbyists, to pay for their seat at the table, to help write the laws that will benefit them and negatively impact us, and we, the people, get left behind. This is the state of affairs that we are facing in this country right now, and this is at the heart of what needs to change, to bring these values and principles of service above self to the forefront, to make sure that our government is truly for the people, that our voices are heard, that the well-being and the interests of our people and our planet are being put at the forefront of these decisions that are being made in every single part of our lives, from domestic policy to foreign policy, in every single part of our lives. Now sometimes as we organize, as we gather around kitchen tables and in living rooms and in classrooms and workplaces, it seems like the obstacles are just too great. That the powers that be are so deeply entrenched. How is it possible that we can overcome? How is it possible that our voices can be heard? Really the answer to that is that the choice is ours to make sure that our voices are heard. Because no matter how much money they have, no matter how much power they have, History shows us time and time again that there is nothing more powerful when we the people rise up and make sure that our voices are heard. When we the people stand united, motivated by this care and this love that we have for each other and for our country. And when we do that, there is no obstacle we cannot overcome. There is no obstacle we cannot overcome. When I first ran for Congress in Hawaii in 2012, I was told over and over and over again not to waste my time. Not to waste my time. There was another candidate in the race who had all the campaign money, who had all the campaign endorsements from business and labor and everybody who was somebody, as we say in Hawaii. Don't bother. Maybe come back and try again in 10 or 20 or 30 years. <laughs> That's what I was told. <laughs> but you see, the mistake that they made, the political prognosticators and pundits there, was they forgot who actually decides our elections. Who really has a say? They forgot that that power lies within the hands of the people. 
And in that campaign, that's where I focused. And it was a tough campaign. I was virtually unknown when we began that campaign, but we worked hard and I went to communities all across our state and every island across Hawaii asking people for the opportunity to serve them. Letting them know this was my job interview and that the decision lied with them. And we ended up overcoming all of the odds and all of the naysayers where we won that campaign in a primary, in a challenging primary by a 22% margin of victory. So when people say that you can't challenge the establishment, you can't challenge the powers that be, you can't lift up the voices of the people, I have seen in my own life, as we have seen throughout our country's history, as we have seen in the 2018 elections, how that is not the case. So we cannot underestimate the power within our own voices. And especially at a time like this, we must do the hard work. We must have the courage and the strength to stand together, and to stand united, to bring about the kind of big changes we need to see. To bring about the passage of legislation like Medicare for All. To make sure that every person in this country, every American, no matter how much or how little we have in our pockets, if we are sick, we are able to get the care that we need. When we stand united, we can bring about the kind of change we need to see to fix our terribly broken criminal justice system, where private prisons are profiting on the backs of our brothers and sisters, where we have a system that is working against those who walk through those prison doors, keeping recidivism rates high. When people go through and they, they do their time and they walk out, they are set up for failure from the moment they step outside those doors because the lack of services being provided that can help set them up for success. We're seeing how our continued failed war on drugs is tearing people apart, tearing families apart, ruining people's lives. I just introduced legislation in Congress a couple of weeks ago called the ending the Federal Marijuana Prohibition Act. And this bill, Yay. Thank you. this is the only bipartisan bill in Congress that does this, that ends the federal prohibition on marijuana. My colleague, a Republican from Alaska named Don Young, was there and stood with me in leading this effort. And as we introduced the bill, we held a press conference and we invited people from uh, different parts of the community to share their stories. And so we had small business owners who are working in the cannabis industry in Washington and who are dealing with every day wondering if the federal government will prosecute them for their business, which is legal in the District of Columbia, just as our businesses and people in 33 other states where some form of cannabis has been made legal. We had doctors there who were talking about how they have seen time and time again in states that have legalized some form of cannabis a direct correlation in the reduction of opioid addiction and opioid related deaths. So if leaders in Congress are serious about dealing with this opioid addiction, let's take this first important step and end the federal marijuana prohibition. We had a veteran there who talked about how our veterans are struggling and dealing with the fact that in the VA, whether they're dealing with post-traumatic stress or traumatic brain injury or chronic pain from combat-related injuries, doctors in the VA are prohibited from giving them a referral to a cannabis dispensary for medical marijuana. So what are they left with? They're left with opioids these highly addictive opioids. I met with a veteran in Manchester earlier today, a Marine who was deployed a couple of times to the Middle East. He got blown up 29 times. He came home with severe post-traumatic stress, got a 100% disability rating from the VA because of his injuries, and the VA was giving him these opioids. And then one day they said, okay, we think you're better. And they stopped. They stopped. 
What do you think happened? Exactly. Heroin. Because like 80% of heroin addicts, they started with these opioids. And so he put it nicely as he was just telling me about his own story. He said he got into a little bit of trouble. And the fact that he had such uh, a positive and gentle outlook on things was amazing to me given what he had been through. But he was a living example of some of the problems that we continue to face. The lack of access to veterans treatment courts and drug courts and these other paths that divert people away from a criminal justice system and really what they need are just some help. There was another uh, person who attended that press conference in DC, a guy named Harry, uh, who was from Virginia. He was not an activist or an advocate. He was somebody who got a call the night before saying, hey, they're doing this press conference in DC and I really think the country needs to hear your story. Harry's African-American, was going to college in Virginia, studying computer science, bright outlook on his life when he was arrested for marijuana possession, use. Immediately, he got two back-to-back -back mandatory minimum sentences of five years, a total of 10 years. No ifs, ands, or buts. He served 10 years in prison. He talked about his cellmate who shot someone in the chest and killed him. And his cellmate got out of prison before he did. Harry's life was completely changed because of this ongoing prohibition and this failed war on drugs. These are the people whose voices we need to hear. They symbolize those who are being impacted by these failed policies. You know, there are so many different areas that we need to address. We need to address the continued discrimination that we are seeing against our LGBTQ Americans. I posted something recently when we introduced, reintroduced the Equality Act in Congress about why it's important. And some of the social media comments, you know, I scroll through sometimes and see what's, what's the conversation like, what are people talking about? And some people said, we don't need this anymore. This is not necessary. And then there were others who were commenting and saying, hey, yes. A friend of mine saying that she and her wife still struggled for a very long time in the state of Florida just to get a house, just to get a place to live. People are being discriminated in their places of work. There are so many examples of this discrimination that's continuing today that we have to stand united against to bring about changes like that, to pass the Equality Act, bring about changes to reform our immigration system that continues to cause so much harm on so many people, bring about changes to address climate change, to protect our environment, to make sure that we are making the kinds of bold investments that we need to make away from fossil fuels and investing in a green renewable energy economy. This is essential for our future. None of these issues are partisan issues. I was in Merrimack earlier today where I talked with residents there and heard from residents there about how they're being poisoned by their water. People are being poisoned by our water. And, and as I listened to them, my heart was breaking for what they're going through, how their children are dealing with health illnesses and disabilities that, you know, at 10, 11, 12 years old, shouldn't be happening. A woman shared uh, a, story, a story about her husband who served 26 years in the military and who was de dealing with serious illnesses now that someone of his age and his uh, ability, his physical ability, should not be dealing with. How is it possible that here in the United States of America that we cannot make sure that every American can drink clean water? So we talk about the need to protect our environment. We're talking about a concern that is universal to all of us that is shared 
by all of us. Now, as we look at these kinds of investments we need to make in all these different areas, in education, in infrastructure, the needs that each of us has in every community in this country, there is one issue that is central to our ability to address these needs, to make these kinds of investments that we need to make. And that issue is the cost of war. The cost of war. Why is this a central issue to everything else? There is a high human cost of war that is being paid for by our men and women in uniform that is being paid for by our veterans who come home with wounds both seen and unseen, that is being paid for by those who pay the ultimate price and sacrifice their lives in service to our country. Friends of mine, people who I've had the privilege to serve with and to know, their families, their loved ones who are left behind. This high cost of war that is being paid for by the lives of the people in the countries where we continue to wage these counterproductive regime change wars. The suffering and the death and destruction that's caused as a result. The cost of this war is undermining our own national security as we see in countries like Libya and Iraq and in Syria how terrorist groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda are actually strengthened because of these regime change wars that we wage. And we see the cost of war taking a toll on every single one of us. We see how every single one of us is quietly paying the price for war, whether you realize it or not. Because there are trillions of dollars, trillions of our hard-earned taxpayer dollars that are coming out of our pockets to pay for these regime change wars, this nuclear arms race that this president has kicked off and escalated by doing things like withdrawing from the Iran nuclear deal, by doing things like withdrawing from the historic INF treaty that was negotiated by Reagan and Gorbachev 30 years ago that drastically reduced the numbers of nuclear weapons and missiles in the world, drastically reduced the risk of nuclear catastrophe in the world. And we see ourselves in a place today where we are essentially in a new Cold War with escalating tensions between the United States and nuclear armed countries like Russia and China. So we see how this cost of war is central to every other issue because unless and until we end these regime change war, this new Cold War and nuclear arms race, and create this peace dividend by taking the trillions of dollars we're spending on these wars and weapons and bringing it home, back into our pockets, back into our communities, back into serving the needs of our people. Unless we do this, we will not have the resources. We will not have the money that we need to make those investments. This is the reality that we're facing. And this is why, even as some people ask me, Tulsi, why do you talk about foreign policy so much? Why do you talk about the cost of war when there are so many other issues that keep us up at night, that we're concerned about, that are affecting our kids and our husbands and wives and neighbors and friends? It is because unless we deal with and address this cost of war, we cannot begin to address these other urgent issues that we face. Now, I want to touch on something given the theme of this series that, again, often goes um, unsaid, that is too often not focused about. And that is how the very first casualty of war is our civil liberties, is our privacy. And we see a lot of examples of this throughout history. We look back to a lot of folks from my home state who were very much affected during World War II with the mass internment of Japanese Americans. We had families in Hawaii who were literally torn apart, 
mothers and fathers taken from their homes, teachers taken from their classrooms, from their place of work, and shipped off to internment camps. We see how during the Cold War, the whole McCarthy era of oppression and the violation of civil liberties and constitutional rights of Americans during that time. This House Committee on Un-American Activities investigating and surveilling and violating the civil liberties and privacies of everyday Americans. Because what? They were talking to the Russians or the, the Soviet Union or communists or are you this or are you that or... And the sad part is that we're seeing a lot of this same tones in the conversations we're seeing today. Obviously, we have to look to 9-11 and what happened after 9-11 with the Patriot Act and how much of our civil liberties were violated by overreach from many of these intelligence agencies. And you look to all of these different examples and you see how in every one of them it was our security and safety that was used as an excuse to violate our Fourth Amendment rights, to foment this climate of fear in order to allow this to happen. I'm a co-founder of the Fourth Amendment Caucus in Congress. It's a bipartisan caucus that focuses on protecting our civil liberties, on looking at those areas of the Patriot Act that violate our constitutional rights and closing them. This is something that we're continuing to focus on and continuing to do because these things are still happening. This isn't something that just happened before. And now we're in a place where we're dealing with not only overreach by intelligence agencies within our government, but also a violation of privacy by big tech monopolies like Google and Facebook. The point is with all of this is we cannot afford to be complacent about these freedoms that we hold dear. We cannot afford to be complacent because there are challenges and threats all the time. And so as we look at these, these challenges that we face, we see at every turn, at every uh, opportunity, the need for us to stand united to bring about the kind of change we need to see, the kind of change that puts the well-being of our people and our country at the forefront. We see the need for us to stand united to bend the arc of history away from war and towards peace, to make sure that we can create this path forward towards a bright future that ensures opportunity and equality and justice and respect for all people. This is why I'm running for president. This is not a game. This is not just about politics. This is about our lives. This is about our future about making sure that we have one. And that's my promise to you as President and Commander in Chief, I will end these regime change wars, this work to end this new Cold War and nuclear arms race and bring this peace dividend home to invest in our people and our future. Thank you so much, aloha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. I think you. you will find that a number of the questions that are going to get asked tonight are going to touch upon the themes that you mentioned in that speech. Um, so we have a combination of questions that are on index cards submitted from audience members, and then we'll, do, we'll take a number of questions uh, from the audience directly. Great. We are going to start with one on the card that actually touches upon something that you said, which is you're a, you're a great expert on privacy. Mm -hmm. If people have been paying attention to the news, Facebook dropped a pretty big announcement this week that they happened to expose hundreds of thousands of people's Instagram passwords. Um, shocking, I know. <laughs> in response to that, so the question is, as president, how would you protect consumer data in this world of big tech? Yeah. Uh, this is such an important question, uh, as so much of our lives is captured online, mm -hmm. really. Uh, Look, I think, w especially with these big monopolies, 
uh, that are, are not only invading our privacy and misusing the information that we share with them, uh, we're also seeing how they crush any others who try to compete or who try to offer other services. You see this happening here in the United States as well as is happening uh, in Europe. So we need to work out uh, oversight and accountability, walking that balance uh, to make sure that government is not overstepping its boundaries, but that we are doing our job to protect people, to protect our, inf our information, to protect consumer data. Uh, so this is something that I'm looking at, seeing exactly uh, what actions need to be taken so that there is a punitive damage on companies that treat our information so lightly and not take seriously our rights and our privacy. Do you think there should be consequences for companies like Facebook that there have these be. exposures? I think there absolutely should be. Questions from the audience. We'll go back and forth. We're right here in the front row. Okay. Well, as you can see, free press, free speech, yeah. free Julian. Yeah. Free speech, free. Free press, free speech, free Julian. I know you've been outspoken right from the get-go about Julian Assange's arrest. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. I would like you to put in your platform to pardon him, to pardon Chelsea Manning, who's already been pardoned, mm -hmm. but who has, as we know, has been reprisoned yeah. because he won't speak against WikiLeaks and Julian, and to Pardon Snowden. I beg you to do that. Thank you. Oh, I forgot. I have a microphone right here. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you both for being here and, and your shirts speaking out uh, on why we need to protect well, we our free peace. press. No, I thank you. Thank you on all fronts. <laughs> Uh, look, the, let me. I just want to add, add a little bit to what we ha saw recently uh, with what happened uh, with Julian Assange's arrest. Uh, and I want to thank the ACLU because the ACLU was, I think, one of the lone voices speaking for freedom uh, in a whole choir of people who were cheering on his arrest and who were trying to say, distract from what was really happening by saying, look, this is not about freedom of speech. This is not about freedom of the press. It's about a conspiracy charge. When we really understand the bigger picture of what's happening and how dangerous it is for our government to be in a position of creating this, this, clim this fear-based climate that whether you are a journalist or a publisher, or for any of us as everyday Americans, if we put out information or if we say things or do things that the government doesn't like, then there will be consequences. It doesn't get, it doesn't get much more offensive to us as Americans to have our freedom so directly undermined as that. There's a reason it's the First Amendment. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. We'll get to those after the event. Very quick. Yeah. A limited number of yeah. handouts for people who want to write letters to him. Who so we're going to move on to other questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, so during you. your opening remarks, yeah. there was a lot of talk about ending mass incarceration and the impact of the criminal justice system. So one of the questions that's actually come up at a number of these forums is would you support restoring voting rights to those who have been formerly incarcerated? Yeah. And then the second question that's actually here is would you support allowing people in prison to vote? Uh, great questions. I think uh, to the first question, and I, I have been outspoken on this, uh, is we must restore those voting rights to those who are formerly incarcerated. Otherwise, how can, how can we say once you serve your time, once you have done uh, done your time, that we want you to come back in and enter society and get a job and, and to live a successful life, but your voice is not allowed to be heard. Uh, so that is a change that we need to see made across this country. I know there are some states that are doing this on the state by state level, but we need to see this change across the country. Uh, I have concerns about allowing uh, four votes for those who are currently incarcerated because I think it provides uh, a danger of 
those who are in positions of power over those who are incarcerated, whether they be prison guards or wardens or whatever, unfairly exercising or abusing their authority to try to uh, leverage their position to get people to vote one way or another, to say you will vote for this party or this person or else consequences. So I think that's a danger that we've got to be concerned about uh, for those who are currently incarcerated. Other questions from the audience? We'll go right. Thank you so much. So one in five Americans, including 19% of likely voters, are people with disabilities. Can you talk a little bit about how you would make your campaign accessible to people with disabilities? And if you're elected, how you'll make sure you, that people with disabilities are employed in your administration? Thank you very much. You know, one of the things that, that we, uh, we've started to do in our campaign uh, is to try as hard as possible to make sure that the videos that we are putting out are videos with subtitles. It takes us a little bit more time to make sure that that happens, but understand how important it is to make sure that everyone is able to, to get the message uh, that we are sending out. Uh, at different campaign events, uh, when we get RSVPs from people who say that they need a signer or need, need help, then we make sure that we've got someone there who can provide that service. I think it's important as we look to our offices and, and my administration, if elected president, uh, to make sure that we are upholding um, the rights of every American and welcoming those who may have different disabilities, who have, may have different abilities, uh, and providing them and benefiting from their um, offer to serve this country. Thank you. So we have a specific question. Sure. Um, this relates to reproductive rights, which is, would you commit to lifting the Hyde Amendment and other government bans on insurance coverage for abortion services? Uh, yes. That, that is what is uh, already within the legislation uh, that I'm supporting uh, within Congress. Simple. We like easy. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so one thing I admire most about you is your determination to fix our broken criminal justice system. And earlier tonight, you mentioned your bipartisan legislation to end the prohibition of marijuana, which I love. Um, as President of the United States, would you support the release of inmates incarcerated for purely nonviolent marijuana charges? Yes. Yes. I like yes. Uh, as, as my legislation looks forward to ending this federal marijuana prohibition, uh, we're all, I'm also a co-sponsor of legislation that would deal with those, yeah, both uh, those who have criminal records from their past and expunging those records, but we do also uh, have to address those who are incur currently incarcerated for nonviolent marijuana charges. That was a short one. We'll go over to this side of the room. Hello, Congressman, Congresswoman <laughs> Gabbard. Hi, uh, my name is Alex and I'm an ACLU voter, which means civil rights and civil liberties are super important to me. Um, I am non-binary and genderqueer. Uh, this means my gender falls in between male and female and I use they, them pronouns. Uh, here in New Hampshire, we have two bills currently being voted on that would um, add a third gender option to birth records and state issued IDs. My question for you is, what would you do to support the recognition of American adults and children whose gender does not fit in the male or female boxes? Thank you. Well, I think we can look to changes that are already being made. Uh, it sounds like this, these uh, bills that are before your legislature here, uh, and there are other bills that have already been passed in other states uh, to provide that recognition. I think it's something that we shouldn't just leave for the states to do, but it's something that should be done at the federal level as well. Right. Yeah. Um, so one other question we'll have from the note cards. This goes back to criminal justice reform, which is a very reoccurring theme here. Um, but it relates to surveillance and concerns that as the, the effort towards mass incarceration picks up, that we'll end up replacing physical prisons with surveillance. Mm. 
So as president, how would you prevent surveillance from being used specifically against communities of color? Yeah, once again, you know, this comes down to uh, our, our Fourth Amendment rights uh, and how there, continued, there are continued efforts to, to undermine those rights. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not personally familiar with different proposals that are being pushed forward that accomplish what you were saying, but I think it's important for us all uh, to, to keep an eye out for those to make sure that the rights of every American um, are not being violated, that are not being undermined. And I think this is, this is the problem about the proposition that is often placed before us, is it's, it's a choice between your constitutional rights and your safety. And this is a false choice. It's not a choice that any one of us should, should have to make in this country. On that, just because I know it's in here as well and it's on the related topic, what's your position on the Patriot Act? We have to go through every single provision of the Patriot Act uh, at, to determine what needs to be taken out and repealed because it violates our Fourth Amendment rights. We need to take out those un unconstitutional provisions that we have seen already too often being used um, and abused that undermine our Fourth Amendment rights. There are a number of bills and amendments that we have pushed through in Congress, some successfully, some haven't passed, um, that seek to close those, uh, both those loopholes and get rid of those provisions that allow overreaching by the intelligence agencies, but also by some of the tech companies who build these back doors into their technology, whether it be phones or computers, that allow the intelligence uh, agencies to, to come in and collect our information without us even knowing about it. Good evening, Congressman. Good evening. Uh, you were talking earlier about the dark hole that is Washington, right? Yeah. And, and I'm, I would argue that it's actually a dark tunnel of climate change. Mm. And that dark tunnel, we have no idea what's coming at us from either side, and we have no idea what's at the end. There may be a point because of a catastrophic event where you would have to, to declare martial law. Hmm. How does your military training help provide you with the ability to do that fairly and equitably? That's a, that's a huge hypothetical <laughs> we're talking about here. It's a significant possibility. For a number of reasons. Um, I think my experience both as a soldier uh, and one who has been deployed to the Middle East, I have a unique appreciation for our freedoms, the power that comes along with those who serve in our military, and the need for us, the responsibility that we have in government, in a civilian-led government that we have, to make sure that those powers are not being abused. I don't take lightly the fact that um, when we as service members enlist and we take an oath to serve our country, to uphold the Constitution, that's not a small thing. And so I think through my service, both in the military as well as in Congress, I would have a unique ability to be able to strike that balance to make sure that ultimately a, there's not a violation of our constitutional rights. Good answer. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? I want to try and get up higher levels here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, a couple other campaigns are beginning to advocate for universal basic income. Mm. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, if that's something your campaigns yeah. looked at, you know, perhaps yeah. um, ending some of the wars in the Middle East, you might have additional um, monies, and that might be something yeah. you might be able to do. Yeah, no, thanks for your question. It's something that I am currently looking at. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of potential and opportunity um, to address, sorry, the question was about universal basic income and whether or not that's something that, that we're considering. It is something I'm considering and doing my research to, to see and understand um, what all the ramifications would be, pros and cons, cost, uh, to look to see how we could potentially use it to eliminate some of the costs that go towards 
bureaucracies and empower people. So stay tuned on that one. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, thank you for coming. Thank you. So we have a really divided country right now. And I really liked what you said before about rising up and taking our government back. Yeah. But I would maintain that there are a lot of people in this country who said, we rose up and took our government back, and that's why we voted for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to those people, or what would you do to try and unite our country again? I think it's important for us to not further deepen those divides that we f that we see exist right now in our country that really fall between those who voted for this president and those who voted against him. Because as I've found through different communities that I've gone through, uh, different people that I've met, I've met people and I know people who voted for Donald Trump. And rather than just writing them off as the others or the other team or the enemy or the opposition or whatever it may be, the only way we can come together in this country is by building those bridges and having those conversations that are based on respect and actually listening to each other. Yeah. Recognizing that there are a lot of different reasons why people vote the way they do, whether we agree with the way they vote or not. In order for us to be able to make progress in this country, we have to better understand each other. And there were a lot of people who voted for Donald Trump because they were afraid. Dealing with threats on their own economic security, their ability to provide for their families. People who voted the way they did because they feel like they've been completely left behind. They have not been heard. Democrats who voted for President Obama twice, then voting for Donald Trump. How does that make sense? We won't know unless we have these conversations and hear about the problems and concerns and fears that people have in this country. And hear their voices and then say, okay, you and I might agree on a few issues or a number of issues or one issue. We may disagree on many others, but we can respect each other. We can disagree without being disagreeable and recognize that as Americans, we have to come together we have to bring our country together to move forward. Otherwise, we will remain in this perpetual state of one side against the other side, arrows pointed at each other, making no progress on any of these issues. So many of the issues we've talked about this evening have bipartisan support. People on all ends of the political spectrum are very concerned about. Criminal justice reform being a perfect example if we allowed ourselves to remain in our opposing camps, we would not be able to see the kind of progress we are seeing now on criminal justice reform with the passage of the First Step Act in Congress, where we have the ACLU has been a tremendous leader on this issue. And working with, working with very conservative organizations, setting differences on many other issues aside and saying, hey, we've got the opportunity in this country to help a whole lot of people, to save a whole lot of lives, to reunite families, to give people a second uh, chance at a future by working together, passing legislation, bringing about the kind of change we need to see. This is what we need more of in this country, and we will never achieve it as long as both sides turn up their noses at each other and walk in opposite directions. Thank you. So, you mentioned the First Step Act to me, yeah. which, and every time I hear it, my question is, what's the second yeah. act? Yeah. Um, so the question to you is, as president, can you lay out specific policies that you would do in a second step act to end mass incarceration? Well, the, the Second Step Act, or there's, there's not a specific bill yet. I know some have been introduced, but uh, with some organizations like Cut 50 and others, uh, the next step towards this is, is sentencing reform uh, and seeing how we can uh, make sure that people like Harry, who I spoke about, are not having their lives ruined by these mandatory minimums. We need to get rid of the cash bail system that is disproportionately impacting people of color 
and people living in poverty all across this country. Uh, we've got to, again, deal with the failed war on drugs and how it's continuing to impact people and ruin uh, their lives. There's a whole host of actions that we need to take both in dealing with sentencing reform as well as dealing with what happens after. What happens after to make sure that we don't continue to have this revolving door that we know exists in, in so many of our communities. So given exactly what you just said in the mention of Cut 50, um, as president, would you commit to reducing mass incarceration by 50%? Yes. Yeah. Question. Thank you. Congresswoman, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Peyton Livingston. I'm the co-chair of the Bow Democrats down the road. I uh, can't support any candidate, but I love your thoughts on the great experiment. I do want to point out the fact that I love you're the first candidate to bring the Constitution back in the preamble, we the people, because it's I think it goes understated nowadays that you yourself, as well as almost 50% of this room, were not thought of when that was first penned. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Now, uh, my, go ahead. She deserves it. She's the future. <laughs> My question, um, so being a white male from privilege, uh, I want, exactly I am, I admit it, I want you to explain to people in my standing as well as others more about your story because it's honestly striking and I really think we need to bring more lightning to it. I hope that guy's filming a documentary for you because you deserve a documentary. But you That's have... my husband, by the way. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's right, I forgot you were. So you have an extremely unique individual cultural identity. You have a great military, oh, sorry. You have wonderful military service and exceptional public service, and you grew up in Hawaii, that's awesome. But on top of, of all of that, um, you're also part Samoan, uh, and your interest also extends to New Zealand. And there's what better representation of a country that is strength through unity and progress, right? That's exactly what you're trying to bring back to the United States. Uh, and I don't think there's a good, I think there's a, I know I'm getting there, I'm getting, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mansplaining, I don't mean to mansplain, I just need to highlight how awesome she is. <laughs> I promise, I will give the microphone back in one minute. Uh, the Hakka represents a great unity through strength. Yeah. Um, so as the commander in chief, you've said a lot about it, but how will you use your cultural identity, your strength through your service, and the unity you've shown as a public servant to bring us all together? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank, no, thank you. And thanks for your, your leadership in the party. Um, oh, thank you. I'll take you up on that. <laughs> All right. Cool. Uh, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to, um, to have had the upbringing that, that I've had, to, grow, to have grown up in a place like Hawaii where... Um, the quote-unquote minorities are the majority, and where, look, whether it's ethnic or racial or religious diversity, this was something that is just a part of, of our lives. Uh, for a time there uh, in Hawaii, for our, our four delegates to Congress just a couple of years ago, we had a practicing Hindu, two Buddhists, and a Jew. <laughs> so our, our diversity continuing to be, to be represented. Um, you know, the, the short answer to your question is uh, there's no way to separate me from those experiences and, and those lessons that I've learned throughout my life in the kind of leadership that I seek uh, to bring to our country, uh, to put the people first. You know, these words sound simple, but they're so powerful and they're so necessary for us to keep at the forefront of everything that we do to put people ahead of profits, to put people ahead of politics, to put the well-being of our people and our country and our planet at the forefront of the decisions that are being made because in every single respect, we are seeing how that is not happening. We are seeing corporate interests being put ahead of the interests of the people. Corporate interests being put ahead of the interests of our planet and climate change and our future. We're seeing the interests of other countries being put ahead of the interests of the people. We saw this just the other day with President Trump's vetoing the War Powers Resolution that was passed with bipartisan support 
through the House and the Senate. How many bills do that these days? Not very many. But we recognize the calls from the American people. We recognize the necessity for Congress to exercise our constitutional responsibility to put about an end to this U.S. support for Saudi Arabia's genocidal war in Yemen. It's caused the worst humanitarian crisis in a generation, killed tens of thousands of civilians, causing millions to starve and to suffer. President Trump vetoed this bill, his second veto of his presidency, because he's putting the interests of Saudi Arabia before the interests of the American people. This is what needs to change. This is what we talk about. We put the people first. This is one example among many about why we have to bring about that change. So speaking of humanitarian crises, we have one here at home um, on our southern border. And immigration is an issue that the ACLU is very heavily involved in. Uh, and so the question to you is, as president, how would you go about, um, through bipartisan support, finding an immigration answer to this and ensuring a path to citizenship? This is one of those issues that requires us to be able to not only have those conversations in Congress, but to have these conversations within our communities, where in some places this continues to be a highly divisive uh, topic. Um, unless we're willing to do that, and that's what I've seen in Congress, there's been a very small number of people who have been willing to reach across the aisle. Uh, but we've done so successfully in, in getting a significant amount of support for things like uh, the DREAM Act, legislation that will finally provide certainty for our dreamers in this country. As we know, people who were brought here as kids through no choice of their own, this being the only home that they've ever known. A dreamer works for me in my congressional office. And the concern I hear from him about this constant state of uncertainty, of never knowing if that deportation is around the corner. For him, his family is from Africa. He doesn't speak any of the languages there. And it's frightening for him and his sister and their family to think about what that would mean for them. The rhetoric that we are seeing that is inflaming tensions around uh, immigration and the crisis that we are seeing at the border, uh, we have to overcome them in order to bring about the kind of comprehensive immigration reform that we need to see that has to do with border security, that has to do with dedicating the resources to the judges there who are uh, seeing people who are, are coming and seeking legal asylum. We have to deal with how broken the legal immigration system is and how negatively it's impacting people, how negatively it's impacting our economy. There's a lot of focus, rightly so, about what is happening at the border and the people who are being harmed and impacted by what's going on there. But there are so many changes and things that, that we need to deal with as we talk about comprehensive immigration reform. We can't give up on this. It's too big of an issue. It can only be done once again when we're willing to actually work with people who may disagree with us in some areas, but I know there is common ground to be found. I want to follow up on that with one issue that's very specific to New Hampshire, uh, which is Customs and Border Patrol has been conducting quote unquote immigration checkpoints um, along I-93 North. Yeah. And they claim that they have the authority to do so within 100 miles of the border, uh, which essentially encompasses all of New Hampshire. Um, and so the, one of the questions that we've been asking is, would you support reducing CBP jurisdiction to 25 miles from the border? Um, I, I think I would support a reduction. I'd want to see what's the magic around 25 versus 20 versus 30. Uh, so it's an issue that I'd want to look, look more into. But for, but for a state like yours, uh, I can see how violating and problematic the current status is cause some headaches here. Um, we'll come over to this side. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, I think what uh, specifically brings me here is because of Hawaii. I uh, read your story. Uh, you're from Hawaii. Well, I started my uh, American school 10 years ago in Hawaii. So um, I'm very, besides that, I'm very impressed by you to have this 
you know, um, great opportunity to serve for this great country at very uh, young age. So my question is quite simple. Uh, what are those incentives to have you serve for this great nation? And secondly, another quick question is that you may just mentioned the diversity, yeah. uh, domestically and internationally. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, in today's world, for some issues such as the climate change, it's not an issue of an individual country. Instead, it should be a global issue. So my second question is that what's your vision, you know, for the America, this great country, to be played in the 21st century? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll answer your, your second question first. Uh, as we look at this 21st century and the role that the United States plays, I think it's important to recognize what's wrong with kind of the fossilized way of thinking of the past and how the United States is relating with and dealing with other countries in this global community that we have. And we've seen that fossilized way of thinking being carried out by this administration that really presents this zero-sum mentality that you are either with us or against us, that if the United States is to win, then everyone else must lose. That's not the way it should be, uh, and that does not serve our interests. We are going to have differences with other countries. We're not going to be able to work out those differences unless we have relationships that are built on cooperation rather than conflict. And for everything from trade to regime change wars, this administration has shown time and again, conflict is their choice. And we're hurt in the process. Uh, so this is the mentality with which we view the world and our relationships with the world completely has to change and recognize, for example, on issues like climate change. Even if we here in the United States do absolutely every single thing we must do right now to address this threat that's before us, it still won't be enough. It requires us to work with other countries in the world to bring about those changes in our global community to halt the climate crisis that's, that's quickly approaching. Uh, to answer your first question quickly, why in the world did I run for State House when I was 21 years old? <laughs> I think you put it a little more diplomatically. I, I, I experienced from a young age that I was happiest when I was doing things for other people. I was doing things to try to be in service to others. Uh, you know, as kids we would gather our friends and go and clean up the beaches on the weekends. Uh, because we saw and, and we, were, we were both hurt and angry when we saw a bunch of trash there on our playground, on our oceans. Uh, I found through, through my time growing up that, um, that I was happiest when I was doing things for other people rather than for myself. Uh, and that's what led me to know, know that I wanted a life of service in some way, shape, or form. So there's one last question that actually ties into that really well, which is something um, pretty current, which is the trans-military ban. Yeah. Um, and the question that we've been asking is, even if that ban were to end tomorrow, damage has been done in terms of our military. And so as somebody who has military experience, how would you undo the harm that's been done by preventing trans members from serving openly? Yeah, I mean, I feel like every, we're, we're hearing uh, stories from different people who uh, had either planned to join the military who are or who are being put out uh, because they're trans and because of this ban. Uh, look, I can tell you as somebody um, who has been in that position where I'm serving with LGBTQ service members, serving deployed, I had no doubt in my mind that they would give their life for me, that I would give my life for them. That as we understand and honor and show our gratitude as a country to those relatively few in this country who voluntarily say, I will put my life on the line to protect and to serve you, to protect and to serve our country. That willingness to serve and sacrifice is something that we must honor. 
Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you. Thank you. So I know there's lots of other questions, and I believe that Congresswoman is going to be sticking around. I've heard there's going to be a photo line, I, I think, think so. so there'll be opportunities for other questions. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight on a Friday evening. Please stay tuned. Um, the Civil Liberties in the President series will be ongoing over the next several months. Our hope is to host every candidate. Um, so if you see a candidate, please nudge them to participate. <laughs> every candidate should want to talk about civil liberties. Um, again, thank you so much for coming and drive safe on your way home tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank that was you awesome. Thanks for doing this.